The countdown is on. Everything you need to get the edge at the end of the market day. This is The Close. The tech sell-off continues, but the rest of the market carries on. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Take a look at the S&P 500 resuming its march higher after yesterday's pullback. And that's really the case for all the major equity indexes led by small caps. This rotation into small caps has pushed up Russell 2000 towards its 2024 high, matching that level, uh, but still leaving it about 7% shy of its all-time high set in late 2021. In fact, you have all 11 industry groups in the Russell higher on the day. The 10-year yield coming down uh, right at around 4.01%, hovering at that 4% level. And and Bitcoin gained 2%. It did approach $70,000. We'll continue to keep a that, an eye on that one as a gauge of uh, risk appetite. But of course, we always start the show off with stocks as we move closer to the closing bells. 58.42 on an S&P 500. And with earnings for the big U.S. banks now over, for all you Wall Streeters out there, you can actually start to feel a little bit better right now about that year-end bonus that you might get. The volume of stock market fundraisings and fixed income deals picking up at the end of the third quarter as bond and high-yield loan markets reopen with a wave of opportunistic debt sales, sales goosed by that Fed's interest rate cut four weeks ago today. If you look at our fixed income business, it's been stable, really a stable business, which has underlying volatility, just it's part of what foreign exchange and rates and credit are. But they, they've been stable. And I, I feel like in both those businesses, there's an element of the leaders pulling away from the pack just because it costs a lot to run those businesses every year. All right, and don't let Ted Pick's demeanor fool you. He really is excited about what we saw in the most recent quarter. And now with the big banks out of the way, the attention is squarely now on other pockets of the market. United Airlines and its earnings, a pleasant surprise, has lifted the airline stocks as a group to their highest levels since the summer of last year. Trucking stocks back to their April levels after J.B. Hunt showed supply-demand dynamics improving. HCA and hospital stocks, all-time highs, and even nuclear stocks like New Scale touching records after Ken Griffin and Amazon backed an investment in the sector. A conversation on that in just a few minutes. As for the weak spots out there, you will still find it in big tech. Five of the Mag 7 in the red and chip equipment stocks still under pressure. This after yesterday's gut check from ASML, that stock losing an additional 7% today. AMAT, KLA, and LAM also down for a second day. Eyes now squarely focused right now, Scarlett, on Taiwan Semi, which is set to report results within the next 12 hours. Absolutely, and we'll be bringing you that when we do get it. But if you take a look at the daily price action, something that's become kind of a trend is the inverse correlation between U.S. Treasuries and oil. So NYMEX crude here in blue uh, climbed steadily higher in the first quarter of this year, peaking at almost $87 a barrel in early April. Over the same period, Treasuries fell, pushing yields up, with a 10-year yield, which is in white, reaching about 4.7% in late April. Since then, you have both oil and yields easing, but you see the swings in the last two months or so. It's not clear whether there is a cause and effect dynamic here, but we do know there's increasing concern about a reacceleration of price pressures, thanks to a still strong U.S. economy at a time when tensions in the Middle East are worsening, and both U.S. presidential candidates are promoting policies that could very well be inflationary. Yield, of course, uh, yields were a big part of the story all year long for the equity market, and they probably promised to be for the foreseeable future. Kicking us off to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon is Tony Rodriguez. He's the head of fixed income strategy over at Nuveen. Joining us here in Studio 2. Great to have you here, Tony. Nice to be with you, Romain. Uh, let's start off with the obvious question here. We talk about the big moves that we had seen over the last few months in the Treasury space, primarily in anticipation of those rate cuts. We seem to have kind of settled into a pattern right now. And I'm wondering if you see any potential for us to see any sort of breakout in yields, either to the upside or downside from where they are right now. Yeah, well, it's a good question, Romain, because some people have been surprised by the fact that you got a 50 base point cut and we've seen a rise in the 10-year yeah. yields. And we think the main drivers for that is really that what's happened over the last month or so is that we've had a big reduction in the downside hard landing risk. Fed cutting 50 was a little bit more than expected. China's come out with some stimulus measures. The jobs report was very strong. Mm -hmm. So all that, I think, cut some of the downside. You're seeing the response in the equity markets, in the credit markets, and with yields, it was higher yields at the long end. So I think the catalyst now would have to be some data that changes that narrative mm -hmm. or some exogenous shock around the oil price or something like that. But otherwise, 
our view is that the long end of the Treasury market mm. has really now gotten to its fair value zone in our mind. Mm. Not pricing in hard landing, not pricing in reacceleration, but just some continued steady growth, lower than we've seen, mm. with inflation continuing to moderate. So what does that open up in terms of investment opportunities, or does it open up anything at all? No, I think it opens up the fact that the credit market should be well supported, right? We just saw bank earnings so far this week and late last week, very strong. Yeah. We've been big fans of the preferred market, for example. We like uh, the debt markets for financials in kind of the five to ten year triple B area. Mm -hmm. So the credit markets will be supported yeah. by a more solid economy. The fact that the Fed will continue in our minds to cut rates but not be overly aggressive, that helps support some of the floating rate sectors that are out there. So if you think of like the leveraged loan market, mm -hmm. gets supported not only by solid credit fundamentals from good growth and good earnings, but also from the fact that the Fed's not going to be cutting another 200 basis points. They'll be methodical. They'll be slow. So we'll still see higher rates for some time. You said you mentioned preferred. So you're talking about bank financial? Yes, company preferred. exactly. Okay, just to be clear. Yeah, yeah, a lot of those big banks, of course, uh, selling debt after they did report results. Um, in terms of the credit market being supported, you look at investment grade spreads. Uh, they've narrowed, and it's now, I believe, at 80 basis points, which is in line with the post-financial crisis low. Is the credit market getting complacent here? Well, the credit market is certainly pricing a lot of good news. Now, there is good news, right? So interest coverage ratios, debt to cash, so the fundamentals are solid. In fact, we have an upgrade to downgrade ratio that's the strongest in 10 years. So when you think about default risk, downgrade risk, the market's in very good shape from a fundamental story. Technically, very well supported with strong demand. The issue is really the valuation, that a lot of that is priced in. Mm -hmm. But if you look back at periods, say, kind of mid-90s, just before the global financial crisis, just before COVID, we've had periods of three to five years in length of spread staying at relatively tight levels until some shock, pandemic, recession, things of that nature, really dislodge it. So. Right now, when you have the outlook, while there are those potential risks out there, like what's happening in the Mideast, et cetera, we really, from a fundamental perspective, could be in this period of a fairly elongated time frame of OK earnings, well-supported credit, so valuations are consistent with that you know, fairly positive outlook. So within credit, what sectors do you like or what has the most room to offer value right now? Yeah, so I mentioned that we do think the preferred market is attractive. Yeah. When we look at the below investment grade areas, we do like the higher quality segments. So think double B rated credit, high single B rated credit, because as you move lower, there's been very strong performance. So now there, there's a little bit greater risk that if we see some slowdown in the economy, those companies will be the ones that are most vulnerable to that. The other areas that have become more interesting, if you look at emerging markets, right, the China response helps support global growth. The Fed cutting rates kind of helps, in our minds, eliminate a headwind to the emerging markets of kind of high rates and strong dollar. So there you're seeing some solid fundamental policies being implemented, both fiscally and in terms of monetary and exchange rate policy, and there's a healthy global backdrop. Is, is there any risk, though, that that could change? I mean, we're three weeks away at least from the election, U.S. election, and three weeks away from another Fed meeting where everyone at least a couple of weeks ago thought we were going to get another maybe 50 basis point cut. I mean, suppose we do get a shock on either one of those or both of those events here. How much does that change the narrative? Well, Romain, you bring up a good point. Yeah. The election's in three weeks. We don't know they'll have an outcome in three weeks. Yeah. So that really could extend some of the potential risk and volatility. So, yes, we do think that the election results could have pretty significant economic implications. We think about trade policy, immigration mm -hmm. policy, regulatory policy. Yeah. So I think from that standpoint, what we're saying about the coming year is that it's really going to be one where your credit underwriting is going to be critical mm -hmm. because some of those factors right now, they're very difficult to plan ahead for. The way we approach it is you don't want to be at the maximum of your risk budget. You want to have a little powder dry because A, valuations are full mm -hmm. and there are some of these risks, not only from the election, but other things that you want to have some powder dry to take advantage of it. And as you invest, I mentioned the higher quality segment of below investment grade, that underwriting is going to be critical so you're with companies or countries where you think they can kind of sustain their credit quality and their ability to repay you through what could be some potential bumps in the road. Are you planning to work 
late on November 5th? Right. It might be yeah. through the end of December <laughs> <laughs> if, if uh, some previous elections yeah. are any guide, but yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Tony, I have to leave it there. And of course, we'll check back in with you soon, I'm sure. Tony Rodriguez is the head of Fixed Income Strategy at Nuveen, kicking us off to the close on this Wednesday afternoon. When we come back after the break, a closer look at Zoom, giving its AI-enabled assistant a makeover. And we're going to talk about how the company has revamped uh, that build into that AI space to make those virtual meetings easier. More meetings, no. Plus, nuclear energy going nuclear with the sector up about 6.5% today alone. How billionaire financier Ken Griffin is energizing those names through his latest investment with Amazon. My two favorite topics, nuclear energy and Ken Griffin. And we're also going to talk about the consumer, a fresh read on the health of the consumer, how tomorrow, what we're expecting out of the latest retail sales numbers, and of course, the upcoming holiday season. Stick with us. A lot more coming up in a second. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Philadelphia Semiconductor Index recouping some of its sell-off yesterday after key equipment supplier ASML issued a tepid outlook. And of course, that sparked a global route in the entire sector. CEO Christophe Fouquet warning this morning that he does expect a slow chip market recovery to extend well into 2025. This, as Taiwan Semi is set to report results overnight. So let's bring in Ian King with Bloomberg News. So, Ian, um, ASML surprised the market, surprised everyone uh, with its disappointing outlook yesterday. But they tried to backtrack a little bit and kind of fill in the details. What did we learn from that uh, conference call today? Yeah, I mean, in a way, what they did was confirm the sort of sum of all fears, which is, well, is this just Intel and Samsung cutting spending? Yes, but it's not just that. Is this China? Yes, but it's not just that. Is this uh, makers of, uh, you know, less complicated chips cutting back? Yes, but not just that. So in, in general, it was a sort of a fairly do a kind of picture for this, you know, hope for recovery and demand. And, and we're not going to see that as, as quickly as we'd hoped. Why are we hearing this out of them and not necessarily out of the other companies, Ian? I mean, we heard, I know TSMC, uh, we actually get the official uh, report uh, coming out uh, later tonight, uh, uh, U.S. time. But we already heard from them uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it seemed that their situation, at least based on what they said publicly, is a lot better. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, there's a good link between that. As we've quoted in the story, the ASML CEO said, without AI demand, and obviously NVIDIA is the main recipient of that AI demand, things would be pretty sad. Um, so the, the link there and, and onto TSMC is that TSMC is the big manufacturer of AI chips for NVIDIA. So that, though, and that particular segment of the market is, is fine. It's, it's the rest that we have to be worried about. It's the rest that we have to be worried about, but is it limited to ASML or does it extend to the rest of the non-AI chip industry? You very much get this narrative now of there's the AI chip side and then there's everything else and the everything else is where there's real concern. Yeah, no, they, everything else is, is everybody, as we saw the stock market reaction. ASML, in, in one respect, is the absolute sort of first responder or first recipient of the bad news in terms of you know, it's, it's very expensive machines. There's a big waiting list for them. It takes, you know, months to make them, a lot longer to install them and then get them up running. So if you're going to cut back on anything, you're going to be telling them, hey, hold on a minute right now. And that we should see sort of play out as earnings period uh, unfolds, really, that, that we'll see this picture replicated. Well, that's what I'm curious about. An investor I was speaking to today said that he's really keeping an eye on Microsoft and Alphabet, basically kind of those hyperscaler companies and the idea that if we are going to see softness, particularly when it comes to the AI side of this whole uh, chip trade, that that's where we're going to see it first. Or maybe that's where we'll see uh, the potential canary in the coal mine out of their results. Yeah, no, I, again, I mean, that was the case last earnings season. Everybody was how long can this AI surge last? And this depends upon the spending of just you know three or four companies, the ones you just mentioned. Should we be worried? Should we be worried? It turned out we didn't need to worry at least three months ago. But again, there's this lingering suspicion that look, how long can they go on spending at this level? You know, where are the where's the return on investment? And until we see the return on investment or spending broaden, that concern will linger. 
All right, Ian King, who covers uh, all things chips for us out there in San Francisco. Uh, as we await uh, in just a few hours, Scarlet Food, those results uh, out of Taiwan Semiconductor uh, coming at a very auspicious time, uh, given uh, that big surprise that we mm -hmm. got out of ASML uh, just over the last uh, day. And given the investor reaction, I think I wonder whether this will color the way those big companies, those big tech companies like Microsoft, like Amazon, like Alphabet frame their conversation about spending on AI. Yeah. You know, even if they move forward with it, how are they going to frame it in terms of how certain they are, how much conviction they are in that spending. And it gets to the whole idea of here of who is buying what and for what reason. If mm -hmm. you're buying this to generate as a business prospect, then investors want to see the revenue generation, yep. the potential profit generation that comes out of that. And if you're not showing it, why are you buying this? Right. Thing? And the details yeah. of the timeline, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. A lot more to talk about here. We're going to focus in on the restaurant sector here. Uh, and a closer look at the owner of KFC, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut, Yum Brands. It's part of our top calls and it's coming up next here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off today with Instacart, a holdup on Instacart. That's the word over at Jeffrey's, which started coverage of the grocery delivery company with the hold recommendation and a $45 price target. The analyst citing a murky profit outlook and warns investors that stagnation in advertising is limiting visibility on margin growth. Instacart shares down 2% on the day. Next up, let's take a look at cosmetics company Estee Lauder, a downgrade to hold over at HSBC. One of the biggest issues, waning luxury sales in China. We've heard this before. HSBC saying Estee Lauder has been very exposed to channels where a large number of products are purchased for resale in mainland China, but without any viable rhyme or reason for such exposure. The analyst says brand equity might end up being more compromised than thought. Those shares slightly lower on the day. And let's end things on, I guess, a somewhat yummier note. Yum Brands, owner of fast food chains, KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, all your favorites' favorites, GD Cowano, not a favorite. Downgrading to hold on the risk. Restaurant development will miss the mark in 2025. The analyst over there, Andrew Charles, says Yum's top growth markets are in a slump, and he's bracing for a negative sales revision at Taco Bell. Dude, that's primarily due to the removal of breakfast items at some of its U.S. locations. Those shares, though, unchanged on the day. And those are some of our top calls. We do want to stick, though, with that last call because I'm pleased to say the analyst behind it joins us now. Andrew Charles, senior research analyst over at TD Cowan. All right, let's start off with the basics here. I mean, we're talking basically about pizza, fried chicken, and tacos, which I think everyone in America loves. So is your concern right now with Yum! Brands is this about broader consumer demand or is this more about how Yum Brands itself is executing on that? Good morning or excuse me, good afternoon. It's more the latter. It's more about globally. Yum is a much more internationally exposed name relative to its global quick service peers. And so Taco Bell US, the crown jewel, it's about one third of the profits of the business. Our concern is more with those two thirds of international, particularly given Yum's emerging market skew where it's having, in our view, trouble with domestic with de with the development that we think is going to weigh on the multiple because they aren't going to be growing as quickly and opening as many stores as they can be for both 24 and 25. And so we think that there's a negative revision to development coming. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen in their key markets around the world, ex-China, they have been slowing. And we've been seeing from the peers, particularly from Domino's and Restaurant Brands International, they've already lowered their 24, and in Domino's case, 25 development outlook. We think that Yum's not going to be immune from that, and that's going to ding the multiple. Talk to me specifically about Taco Bell and what's ailing uh, that particular brand. Yeah, so it's funny. So our prior call on this was more about Taco Bell and that we still believe it's the best part of the portfolio. The, the challenge is, is that we believe that there's going to be a headwind from the reduction of breakfast at some of the underperforming locations. So uh, on September 24th, Yum gave franchisees of Taco Bell the option to reduce to reduce breakfast. Somewhere between one third and two thirds of locations uh, have reduced it. Uh, those stores have a low single digit mix of sales. And so we think there's a one to 2% headwind that's gonna uh, be seen by Yum across the following year as a result of the Taco Bell headwinds. Now, you know, the question is, is that can Taco Bell 
really overpower this. Um, you know, our concern there is that they're about to lap over the value cravings menu for less than three dollars that revamped in January. They've got a big lap coming in in March when it comes to the Cantina Chicken, and so we have no doubt this brand will continue to find great innovation with great value. The challenge is, I think you're going to see a negative revisions as well to sales. And mm -hmm. so primarily the call is development internationally, but the secondary piece around Taco Bell leaves us concerned that, that won't see multiple expansion from Taco Bell Beats. So let's go back to the international angle, which you said is the primary concern. What are the main international growth markets for Yum? Because uh, there is a Yum China, which is separate, which represents all the China business. Are we talking about no China presence here at all in Yum? No, so uh, to your point, Yum China is the franchisee and Yum is the franchisor, so they collect the royalties from Yum China. And so we do have data uh, as reported by Yum China, and it's not China, interestingly. It's uh, all the other markets in uh, Asia, uh, ex Japan and China. So India is a big slowdown, mm. Turkey's been a big slowdown, Southeast Asia's been a big slowdown. Another piece I point to as well is in the U.S., you know, we've seen uh, more uh, an elevated level of Pizza Hut closures from 23, 20, uh, 24 as well so far. And we're worried just based on recent bankruptcy of some large operators combined with the fact that you've got Domino's that has positive traffic right now. And we think has a playbook that will continue positive traffic in 25. This incrementally pressures Pizza Hut U.S. as well. Got it, got it. And it, it sounded like Yum, at least through Taco Bell, is playing the promo discounting game, offering value meals to consumers to drive uh, foot traffic into its stores. Does it need to act on that more aggressively to kind of keep the numbers coming in? Or uh, at some point, that, that's going to run its course and, and hurt margins? So Taco Bell does a great job with value. They're a bit unique that they can go lower price points. And the other thing we like about it is that they innovate at value, while Quick Service Burger does more discounting of core items to get there. Um, we see a lot of value right now across the industry. You know, there's been well-documented trade down amongst lower-income consumers, and we believe that middle-income consumers are increasingly trading up to the fast casuals of the world, the Chipotle's, the Shake Shack, the Cabas, et cetera. And so we think the key here for, for, for Taco Bell is going to be really about menu innovation. They did a great job earlier this year with Cantina Chicken. Hopefully saw the commercials with Jason Sudeikis, a key protein that they really didn't have big, uh, big presence with. Uh, we need more menu innovations like that. And so I think you're going to see more looking ahead. You are going to see more chicken varieties, but I don't think you're going to see anything as big as the chicken launch uh, on the horizon. All right. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Andrew Charles over at TD Cowan. Really appreciate your joining us today. Um, and of course, Romain, maybe the answer is to bring back the, the CEO who's left for <laughs> Starbucks. Uh, yeah, we're left for Starbucks. Yeah, I mean, look, they got to find somebody new. I mean, maybe it is just about, I mean, I feel like all these fast food chains, they kind of live and die by these, not just promotions, but coming up with new products. You know, they're not really new, but you know, you, know, you take a taco and put it in a bun or something and you call it something new. Uh, but you kind of need that, right? I mean, because that's what gets people excited. Yeah, it gets and people, gets people excited. coming back. There, absolutely. You know? And the value uh, proposition can be underestimated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do just want to get to some breaking news before we go to break sure. here. Are uh, those EPA power plant emission curves that we've been so focused on that we've now gotten a, a word now that it has been cleared for now by the Supreme Court. That is the main uh, headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal right now. Remember that the industry had primarily challenged these new EPA rules uh, and now this apparently goes back to an appeals court. So uh, at least for right now, the Supreme Court seems to at least be saying we don't need to deal with this for right now. Send it back down. All right. Coming up, we're going to talk with Zoom about its new AI companion. This is the close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're still looking at stocks holding near about record highs. Uh, right now, the S&P 500 gaining about half of 1%. Big tech kind of moving in different directions here. And let's stay on technology because video conference platform Zoom is hoping that updated AI features can boost the user experience. At its recent Zoomtopia event, Zoom unveiled AI Companion 2.0. The fresh custom add-on comes with flashy new features, many of which are third-party friendly. So joining us with more on these features, these solutions, is Smita Hashim, Chief Product Officer at Zoom. Smita, good to speak with you. Um, I think there's been a lot of excitement or questions around one of the features, which uh, concerns users turning themselves into an avatar to chat with, is it other people or other avatars? I guess I, I haven't understood that part out. I uh, haven't figured that part out. But if you could talk to us about what kind of solution this offers um, and why this might be better than sending a uh, FAQ memo. 
so i think for the for, so we did we did announce a lot um a lot at the at zoomtopia which is a big annual event last week we announced ai companion 2.0 and 2.0 is uh, is an evolution it is included at no additional cost it works across the zoom platform so it works across your meetings your chats your phone calls your documents and it is like the single brain which is behind all of your work streams and you can do things like ask questions help you tell you what's priority help you analyze the information even connect microsoft of office docs or or google docs to it and have it analyze and give that i uh, give those answers back so that's ai companion 2.0 we announced it and hopefully it's launching within like next week or or very soon after uh, we are testing it on the avatars feature which you asked about yes we did also announce that with ai companion 2.0 and this will be coming a little bit later mm-hmm. you will be able to generate uh, you will be able to use about you know a handful of pre canned avatars and you can use them to send a message out i right. really think the main use case is asynchronous messaging so sometimes you want to provide an update to people but you don't want to have a meeting like say you know i'm a product manager i want to send so this is a and okay. currently we have a product product called clips but you know but in this you don't even have to record it you can just give it a text file and it'll it'll do that for you so, so that's what really the use case is sweeter mm-hmm. thank you for explaining all of that um so all these features were uh, launched since um since the last zoomtopia where you often bring out new innovations give us a sense of whether this will add to the cost for customers uh and if not whether this will be something that over time as you further build out these offerings will become a premium product Yeah so we uh, the AI what I described to you the AI companion 2.0 and you know pre canned avatars those are included at no additional cost if you have a Zoom workplace license you get them so no extra cost to the users or our customers we think that's really important we want all of them to benefit from generative AI in addition we did announce a pay for product called a custom AI companion add on So if you choose to buy it and it's very much a choice your AI companion will expand to work across your data within the company which you might have like employee handbooks HR policies or even connect to third party applications like uh, you know say you want to connect across Jira Asana ServiceNow uh, these applications to get more done So if you want those kind of things then you have to pay for the add on but working across yeah so 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 that 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 yeah. you would have to pay for So <laughs> Smita so this is an evolution of Zoom to a large extent I mean of course a lot of us remember it uh, from a few years back when it kind of yeah. just did one thing when I see all of these features I think this is great I also think some of the partnerships that you've talked about and some of the other companies in this tech space are also offering similar suites of products maybe not exactly the same as yours how are you going to be able to differentiate yourself and say that the zoom as a total workforce platform is going to be better than say what some of those other companies offer yeah absolutely uh, so a couple of things first of all i think when we talk to our customers about why they love zoom and i hope that's your experience as well the main f- feedback is we love zoom because it just works So we try to provide a really great user experience and we continue to see a lot of love from customers and that's what we are doing across the workplace platform. We also really focus on providing great value. So our Zoom AI companion is included at no additional cost which is very very different from several of these large customers. So both of those are coming into play for us over here. I do want to emphasize Romain that as we also integrate with the large players like Microsoft and Google and we continue um including even our AI companion 2.0 we integrate if you connect your Microsoft Outlook or upload the docs and we include that at no additional cost as well it's customer's choice how much of zoom they take mm-hmm. we did share at zoomtopia that two out of three enterprise customers are using more than zoom meetings and phone so we are beginning to see a lot of customer traction with these additional products i am curious uh, smita i mean you obviously have a, a big read into what's going on in this space not only of course in your current job at zoom but in your past jobs at microsoft google and elsewhere it gets us to this sense here as to whether we need to see a little bit more consolidation in this space or can all of these products and all of these companies sort of coexist as one So I feel like 
uh, you know, we talk about um, we talk about Microsoft and we talk about Google or Zoom and we talk about them. But the reality is, if you are an enterprise, so first of all, if you're if you are a customer, you want the best product and employee collaboration, customer service. You really want the best products for them. An average enterprise uses 200 plus applications, so they work. They use a lot of different applications. So. Our customers very much value choice. They very much value an open collaboration platform. Yeah. And we continue to make sure it's really cost effective for them as well, as opposed to buying a lot of add-ons for some of the large players. So all of those come into play, but our customers want their choice and they have chosen Zoom and they choose a lot of their applications and we want to serve them in the best ways we can. All right, we're still going strong. Smita Hashim, Chief Product Officer over at Zoom, uh, talking about these new AI tools as Zoom really does expand, Scarlett, from I think what we all remember it at the start of the pandemic where it was just a mm -hmm. kind of convenient way to you know touch base with you know your grandparents or your coworkers and now it really is kind of this broader suite of workplace products. I just want them to fix the function where if you move your hand, it asks you whether you want to raise your hand or not and to, to keep raising your hand. It was like, no, yeah. that, that has not nothing to do with what I'm doing, especially because I do workouts sometimes over Zoom. Oh, 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 okay. And no, like, no, there's no, a lot no, of movement. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. and you, you're, you're never raising your hand. Yeah, yeah. Not like at your desk over there no, in no. the corner or something. Sometimes that too. Okay. All right, well, that would make sense here. Uh, Zoom shares are slightly higher on the day, right around that $68 mark. When we come back here, we're going to talk about some of the highest flyers on the day, and it's nuclear stocks, believe it or not. This after we learned that Amazon and Ken Griffin are making a major investment into small nuclear reactors. We're going to talk about some of those names. We're going to talk about why they're entering this space. It's our stock of the hour and it's coming up next. This, this is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, the only thing better than a stock of the hour is multiple stocks of the hour. We're taking a broader look at the nuclear sector, something I don't think we've ever talked about on this show. But when Amazon and billionaire financier Ken Griffin pump $500 million into the space, well, you have to talk about it. It's an investment in something called small nuclear reactors. And none of that money went into a private company, but you see the public companies there really getting a strong bid on the day on the back of it. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. So basically $500 million going to a private company called Xscale. Never heard of them, but you see New Scale, you see all these utility companies rallying on this. I guess because somehow they see a future, and I guess what, we're all just gonna have small nuclear reactors at our desk or something? I think we're far away yeah. away from that, and I know that yeah. you know that. I think that the big yeah. trend here is nuclear is a big deal right now. I mean, it wasn't so long ago we heard the deal with Microsoft and uh, renewing Three Mile Island. Google had a deal, or Alphabet had a deal earlier uh, this week, and now mm -hmm. Amazon and Ken Griffin, as you mentioned, $500 million. Not a huge amount of money for them, but not a small amount of money either, and the why really has to do with these data centers. So now that these data centers are expecting to eat up so much electricity uh, that folks are saying that we need to find a new source of energy. More specifically, by uh, 2030, uh, data center energy could use as much as 9% of electricity mm -hmm. generation and is expected to drive electricity demand up 15 to 20% over the next decade. So, wow. you know, folks searching for different ways to power all the data centers, and all the like AI. Absolutely. It goes back to AI. It, it does, and this is why utilities have done so well, yes. too, because of the expected demand for Vistra power. Vistra is the top utility on the year, or the top S&P 500 stock on the year. Like, when's the last time that happened? Utilities yeah. are the best performing sector in the second half of this year. Um, the idea that Microsoft has already purchased nuclear power, Google, Google through Amazon, uh, Alphabet and Amazon, check, 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 and maybe Meta will be ne the next to yeah. know, pick up one of those Tesla. smaller companies. I mean, it, it seems exactly. as though, you know, it seems as though this is the hot trend all these companies want in on it, because if the AI craze proves true, and it seems like it is, we don't completely understand what that will look like at this point, we're going to need that power. And so the folks that are really, you know, at the high end, they want to make sure that they have their own power. Now, something to point out about this, Amazon has also made investments in uh, Energy Northwest in Washington. They've also made an investment in Virginia through Dominion. These small nuclear um, uh, reactors, they're not commercially viable yet. They can't be used at scale. So it's almost like the Tesla yeah. uh, robo taxi. You know, yeah. it's, in it's, 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 it's in the future. It's in the future. Yes, it's and investing. Ken Griffin will get one first. I mean, you know, he's got already yes. a stegosaurus in his house, so why not have a nuclear reactor there? But it gets to this idea, though, too. <laughs> what do you think he'll it, cover it, it in? I, 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 I don't Maybe know. the stegosaurus. Something expensive. <laughs> uh, but, I, but, but in all seriousness, though, it gets to this idea that 
everyone, and I mean not just companies, but even individuals to a certain extent, are really now starting to think about power supply in a much different way. The idea of securing it, whether it's through contracts or something like this, where maybe you have your own uh, ability to generate your own power for whatever facility you need. And that's a big a change. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you, Romain. I'm yeah. always stunned when I walk around uh, neighborhoods and I see there are some houses that have solar panels on their entire roofs. Yeah. Or I was somewhere this weekend in Upper Westchester where there was like a field full of solar panels yes. to uh, basically yeah. provide the energy for this entire um, uh, facility that it was. But the question around these yeah. nuclear, do you want it in your backyard? So if you're not the billionaire who has it, or yeah. if you're not benefiting from the company, because yeah. I think that that was a big reason why these nuclear plants were yeah. closed in the past, now they're being reopened. I think that's going to be one of the hurdles. I'm told they're safe, Abigail. Would you want it in your backyard? No, absolutely not. Yeah, I don't think I would either. <laughs> right now, at least. France seems to be okay with it, right? I mean, other countries have managed a way around it. Mm -hmm. Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Now, we've talked about Ken Griffin. Uh, Ken Griffin also in the news because he's found a buyer for one of his luxury properties in Chicago. But, 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 he had to cut the asking price to half of what he originally paid him. Because this is Ken Griffin, we're talking about a lot of money here. Um, this is a 7,500 square foot unit on the 30th floor uh, at number nine Walton. It's a penthouse. Uh, marketed as unfinished, listed for $11 million in July. Uh, Remain, he had purchased it for about $21 million yeah. in 2017. Yeah, well, you know, he sold it, I guess, you know, for a little over 11 million or whatever it is. Why don't we have pictures of this thing? Does Ken Griffiths not want us not to know what, what the inside of this it's thing looks finished. like? It's not finished. Well, can I see that? How do I know it's that? Raw. Maybe it's that's raw. why nobody bought it. They couldn't see the pictures. I'm supposed to buy this thing sight unseen? You were looking to buy? Well, that's not, not at that wild. price. <laughs> <laughs> All right, coming up, we count you down to the closing bells with Callie Cox. I think it opens up the fact that the credit market should be well supported, right? We just saw bank earnings so far this week and late last week, very strong. We've been big fans of the preferred market, for example. We like uh, the debt markets for financials in kind of the five to 10 year triple B area. Mm -hmm. So the credit markets will be supported yeah. by a more solid economy. The supportive conditions for this U.S. financial market, Tony Rodriguez over at Nuveen, helped kick us off to the close just about 10 minutes ago. Another rally in stocks right now, stasis right now when it comes to bonds. But you heard Tony there. He's saying that the backdrop, at least for right now, mm -hmm. is supportive of pretty much all major financial assets. Yeah, I look at the intraday charts for the major stock indexes. They're all kind of melting up, but they're, there's very much a wait and see kind of feel to everything right now, yeah. whether it's earnings, the election, uh, economic data, China stimulus. And the election, too, if you look under the hood, I was taking a look at this today in the options market and the swaps market. You're seeing a lot of hedging right now going on around the potential for the outcome of that election. And in the FX space, there was a great story on the terminal today about everyone's buying hedges on yeah. uh, the Mexican peso, uh, on the Chinese yuan, basically all the currencies that might uh, take a hit, if you will, uh, if one particular candidate gets elected. Well, maybe a while before we find out the results. Uh, in terms of specific sectors in the market, let's just take a look at chips, for instance. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index trying to recover from yesterday's 5.3% sell-off that was triggered by ASML's disappointing bookings. Um, then you have utilities uh, flying high today. The best for force today and in the second half, the latest go-to AI play. And the Russell 2000 climbing 1.7%. I talk about maybe not a whole lot of conviction behind a lot of these trades, but there's a lot of conviction, at least today, behind small caps, uh, thanks to a better performing U.S. economy seen lifting these cyclical companies. Uh all right. Uh, let's get uh, right to it here as we continue to count you down to the closing bells. Callie Cox joining us right now. She's the chief market strategist over at Ritholtz Wealth Management. Just about eight minutes until we get to those bells, Callie. And you heard the sort of uh, layout here. I mean, supportive conditions in the market, a rally that continues here, at least for right now, unabated, despite some of the headwinds in front of us here. Are you confident in what you're seeing in this market right now? We feel pretty good about it. And I want to be clear. I mean, the economy is still under a lot of pressure, so we're not getting our hopes too far up. But we still think the risk of sitting out this market is greater than, you know, maybe being worried about buying a top. And Romain, I think it all goes down to what we're seeing in the economy. We're seeing a little bit of stall in the job market. Uh, we're still seeing consumer spending money, but being a little more cautious as we head into the end of the year. And you know what? That's a really good setup, especially when you have some attractive valuations in small caps and rate sensitive sectors for higher prices. 
Um, but I think it all depends on what we see in the job market. I mean, mm. so far, so good, but um, we're trying not to get too excited. Well, let's just assume that the folks in this market are going to stay invested in this market. And obviously what you guys do over at Ritholtz, it's much more longer term here. So there's no real uh, benefit to jumping in and out. But for those folks who are in it, do you rotate? Do you rotate into a small cap space? Do you rotate into cyclicals or do you just kind of stay the course with maybe what has gotten us so far in this rally, which are those big cap tech names? You look, at this point, I think tech's bar is way too high. Of course, tech has con compelling stories behind it, especially the big tech companies, which have huge competitive advantages and are some of more, the more profitable names on the market. But right now, the valuations are so stretched that I think it makes sense to maybe look at your tech holdings, cut a little bit, and then turn toward more unloved areas of the market. Small caps, like you mentioned, remain, and then also rate-sensitive sectors. Cyclicals, uh, you know, they make me a little nervous at the moment with so much pressure on the economy. Um, I don't think it's the worst idea in the world, especially now that, um, you know, economic expect expectations are so low. But right now, we see the most value in small caps and rate-sensitive sectors. Is it not the worst idea in the world? That's not like a written <laughs> endorsement, Kelly. <laughs> Let's talk. I know. I know. I hedged that a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about those small caps because uh, we're going to get earnings coming out from all the companies pretty soon. It's still early on right now. And of course, you want to see them play catch up to what we've seen in the big caps. Um, which sectors are poised to show the most improvement at this point, given that the U.S. economy has proved to be stronger than a lot of people had anticipated? Well, first of all, Scarlett, I think the bar for this earnings season is really low. I mean, last I checked, analyst expectations were for about 3% growth in earnings uh, in S&P 500 companies. And compared to the last four quarters, um, and especially the four quarters ahead, that's an incredibly low number, especially on 5% revenue growth. Um, you know, I think analysts expect uh, some growth in the communication services sector, uh, which could be a good or a bad thing. Um, you know, that still means the bar is high for those big tech companies. Uh, you know, they're expecting some growth in healthcare as well. You know, I'm interested in looking at the broadening out in sectors. How many sectors are contributing to this earnings growth? Because for so long, it was just tech. And luckily, there's earnings growth expected in eight or nine out of the 11 sectors in the S&P and pretty strong earnings growth, uh, excuse me, revenue growth ex uh, expected in small caps as well. So given how low expectations are, I think that's enough to hurdle the bar. Right. How worried are you after hearing from ASML today and the accidental release of its earnings yesterday? It, it certainly puts a lot more focus on whatever TSMC says tonight. Well, hey, that's a good reason to rebalance your tech holdings, rebalance your semiconductor holdings, look at what's winning or what has won so far this year and see if you could, you know, pull your portfolio a little bit closer uh, to that middle ground because you want to be prepared for either scenario, scenario right? Um, when there are such big valuation gaps in the market, you want to make sure that, you know, you're overexposed to, you know, what could be attractive in value. So, you know, we don't follow the semiconductor uh, industry so closely. Obviously, it's done incredibly well and that uh, opens it up to some challenges, especially when there's a high bar. I am curious, Kelly, we've been talking a lot about investing in the market and primarily those folks who are invested in the market. We have ignored the fact that you still have trillions of dollars in short term money market accounts, trillions more in other cash like instruments here. What is the catalyst that gets some of that money into more, I guess, riskier assets, if you will? Well, I think we're already seeing it, but it's a little complicated, Romaine, because we have these economic worries out there. Um, they've abated a little bit over the past month, but you know they're still there, and for good reason. Uh, the Fed has already started cutting rates. Money market rates are coming down. Uh, Americans are ultra sensitive to rates on cash accounts right now, so you know I think that there's some inertia there. Um, some, you know, I'm a little nervous about the future, and I'm still getting a four percent rate on my money market. So why move right now? But as the Fed continues cutting rates, and we've certainly seen this over history, as the Fed continues cutting rates, that pressure to move and get in markets if the economy stays afloat will become greater and greater. Uh, usually, it takes about a year from the first cut. So yeah. uh, I wouldn't be shocked to see that money stay there for a bit. It, but hopefully be more of a positive catalyst for stocks in the future. All right, Kelly, always great to talk to you. Kelly Cox, Chief Market Strategist over at Ritholtz Wealth Management, counting us down to those closing bells. We're just about uh, 
two and a half minutes away from those bells, Scarlett. And, and we're actually seeing some pretty strong bids come into the market finally here as we get closer to uh, the end of the day. Yeah, particularly small caps. And I bring that up again because we've had so many false starts with this group, this rotation that never seems to last. It goes yeah. on for like a day or two, a week or two, and then it peters out. Yeah, well, you're right. And that's kind of the defensiveness, right? The mm -hmm. idea that once people get a little skittish about economic conditions or whatever, then they flock back in uh, to the big cap tech names. Maybe it holds this time, but a huge outperformance today by the Russell, a full breakdown of all the market moves. That's coming up right now. The Closing Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu taking you through the closing bell, a global simulcast. It starts right now. Tim Stenevik in the radio booth. Carol Nasser taking a three-day week here. Katie Greifeld filling in for her today as we welcome our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, including our partnership with YouTube. I, I have to defend Carol. Oh, she Go was ahead. here today. I did. I saw her, Carol, okay. she but she's great. not here now. She, she got What'd in you say at 4 a.m. this morning because wow. she did Bloomberg surveillance this morning. Well, oh. I think know, she's going back on surveillance tomorrow morning. I oh. got in at 6 a.m., which is not 4 a.m. <laughs> Interesting. Then, it then, all goes back to Katie. Interesting. You know, actually, Tim said on the radio earlier to one of our guests, you know, it isn't all about Katie. And I was like, well, that is news to me, actually. But in any case, big update in markets. Big yeah. update it's markets. It's all about the Russ 2000 today. How, how's that? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, and all about the banks, too. You look at Morgan Stanley and how it's really followed up with uh, what the other big banks have reported. Uh, as everyone keeps telling us, the bar for earnings season is pretty low this time. Uh, yeah, pretty uh, low this time here. But Do so they far, set the bar, though? The companies set the bar. The banks set the bar. That's I don't know who sure. sets the bar, but wherever that bar is and whoever set it, it is low. But look, sometimes that doesn't matter. It was low last the last earnings season. Everyone beat, or at least the folks that we wanted to beat, beat, and investors seem to be pleased with that. I know it's still extremely early in this earnings season, but haven't you been encouraged so far? I mean, you take a look at United, for example. What a day that United yeah, is having. Yeah, big day for airlines. Yeah, of feel? course. You think about Delta, though, last week. That was a little bit of a lemon. Yeah, what's your favorite airline, Katie Greifold? <laughs> no comment. The one right. that gets you there on time. How about that? <laughs> All right, we're going to get back to Katie Greifeld in just a second here, but let's walk you through uh, the closing bell numbers. Green across the screen, and this is actually a little bit of a flip-flop from what we saw earlier in the day when we saw uh, the NASDAQ in the red and the S&P barely holding on to gains. But here we are right now with the Dow Jones Industrial Average closing back above 43,000, 337, higher on the day, eight-tenths of a percent. The S&P up five-tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ up three-tenths of a percent. But let's talk about the outperformers on the day. The S&P 400 mid-caps up 1%. Dow Transport's up 1.9, and the Russell 2000 is going to close higher by 37 points, or 1.6%. All right, taking a look at the S&P 500, you had 358 stocks move higher today, 144 stocks move lower. So gainers outpacing the decliners. Yeah, but the decliners that are there are notable, right? You take a look at the IMAP, and overwhelmingly green with nine out of the 11 sectors, uh, posting gains. But communication services, one of the bigger sectors in the index, is down. You have names like Meta, for instance, lower. Consumer staples losing about two-thirds of one percent. Utilities, uh, very defensive, but also uh, an AI play, uh, up two percent on the day. And financials, I mentioned Morgan Stanley gaining 1.2 percent. REITs higher by one percent as well. Our, All right, we have actually uh, quite a few earnings uh, coming here in the after hours trade. The first one crossing the wire, and that is the railroad CSS revenue coming in at about $3.62 billion. The street was looking for 3.68, so a slight miss on revenue. Also, a slight miss on the bottom line EPS, 46 cents a share. The street was looking for 48 cents a share. Not seeing any guidance here just yet in the initial numbers, but you see the knee jerk reaction, a slight move to the downside. Yeah, I'm just looking through the press release right now and of course they're talking about uh, delivering growth in volume operating income and operating margin but uh, also talking about some of the challenges of late including the recent hurricanes which may have disrupted some service uh, but again I don't see an outlook here in terms of what they're saying uh, operating income just a little more detail on the quarter that did end was 1.35 billion dollars so remain consistent with what you're saying about the bottom line and the top line missing because operating income trailing the average analyst estimate of 1.4 billion okay that conference call happening at 4 30 p.m wall street time we'll bring you updates from that as we get them maybe get some guidance on that call meantime a couple of the gainers as we continue to wait for other companies reporting after hours today morgan stanley shares higher today by 6.5 percent rising the most since 
News of that vaccine coming out in November of 2020. Revenue from the trading business rose 13%. Uh, wealth unit also stood out, generated record revenue of $7.27 billion, higher than analyst expectations, $64 billion in net new assets. Also, you guys talking about airlines. Uh, the airlines index posting the best day since October of 2022, up 6.5%. United Airlines helping to bring that higher by 12.4% today. United shares hitting the highest since February of 2020, going back pre-pandemic. The company forecasts an improved industry outlook now that carriers are cutting excess flights and suppressed profits. That suppressed profits over the summer. And how about a little nuclear energy, small modular reactors, new scale stocks melting up today, higher by 40%. Uh, this after Ken Griffin and Amazon backed uh, an investment in SMR, small nuclear reactors. They're among the backers in a $500 million investment in the company called X Energy. It's privately held and they make advanced nuclear reactors. So optimism in the industry today, new scale a maker of those uh, SMRs up by more than 40% today, a record jump for the company. All right, on the decliner front, uh, starting with Novavax here, absolute wipeout. You can see shares finishing lower by more than 19%. This is after U.S. regulators placed a hold on the company's flu and COVID-19 combo vaccine because you had a study volunteer actually develop a serious nerve disorder, specifically no motor neuropathy. They received the combo shot in January 2023 as part of its study taking place outside the U.S. Trial completed in July 2023. The the patient uh, reported this complication in September 2024. That's just the Novavax thing? Because I just got one of those shots. Yeah. I don't know what brand it is. I would uh, maybe see a doctor about that one. <laughs> Novavax, uh, this is only its worst day since July. So it's been a rough ride for Novavax. Moving swiftly along here, though, also wanted to talk about interactive brokers. Of course, we were talking about this start to earnings season. It's been pretty OK so far if you're a big bank. If you're an interactive broker, it's a little bit of a rough ride. Uh, of course, the brokerage firm's third quarter adjusted earnings per share and total net interest income missed the consensus estimates. And you can see uh, shares finishing lower to the tune of about 4%, worst day since August. And then I wanted to finish up with applied materials, of course. We had the ASML um, uh, hiccup, if you want to call it, yesterday. Wipeout, I could use that word again. Applied materials definitely fell in sympathy yesterday. But what was interesting was to see the follow through today. You can see shares finishing the day more than 3% lower. All right, let's take a quick check check on yields. Not a whole lot of action here on the day. We continue to remain in that holding pattern that we've seen for quite some time. Your 10-year yield right now closing out the day uh, just above 4% here, uh, down about one to two basis points. And that was a similar story across the rest of the curve. You see it there on your screen with the biggest moves coming on the longer end. All right, let's take a look at Kinder Morgan, which is the pipeline company coming out with results. Uh, distributable cash flow per share was 49 cents, missing the consensus estimate by a penny. Uh, in terms of the bottom line, adjustable EBITDA was $1.88 billion, also a miss there uh, of $1.92 billion, which was the consensus estimate. So the stock down about 1% right now in after hours trade. Uh, Kinder Morgan in the press release calling out uh, with war continuing in Ukraine, conflict escalating in the Middle East, calling out geopolitics here. Uh, noting the centrality of energy security to national security has never been more clear. They say they're proud to be part of a sector that provides that energy security to our fellow citizens and increasingly allows allies to forego dependence on those who use energy as a geopolitical weapon. Look at that. Yeah, it's interesting. I will note that these shares, uh, you're seeing, you know, a little bounce around uh, after hours after these earnings. This stock is higher by about 48% uh, on a total return basis through today's close. So the bar was pretty high for this company. Okay. Um, from <laughs> pipelines to Fruit Loops, I guess we go. Yeah, let's do it. Did you guys see that uh, there are protesters outside of Kellogg's? And they're making a demand here. They want to remove the artificial colors from Fruit Loops as well as other cereals here. Okay. And it's happened in other countries. For yeah. example, in Canada, they use concentrated carrot juice, watermelon juice, and blueberry juice mm. to color some of these cereals. This is yeah. according to the Associated Press. But here in the US, we still have artificial colors and chemical preservatives, apparently. Well, of course. Why, of course. They're delicious and they make great colors. 
Well, I think the great colors are more. I don't. Than I, 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 the, the thing that's confusing me about this story. I mean, if you are waking up in the morning and eating Fruit Loops to start your day, do you really care <laughs> about that it has some if artificial anything, colors and flavorings in it? You probably want more colors. I, I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, like you've made a life choice at that point. I mean, you might as well just lean. But into you can it. get the color the way Canadians can get their color, just not if, with artificial colors and chemical preservatives. You can do it through fruit juices. You, remember, exactly. You remember a, a couple of years ago when those college kids did that whole study and they found out that all the different colors of Fruit Loops, that it's actually all the exact same flavor? Oh, yes, I do remember that. Oh, that was actually. trick, so sorry. My, my college producer, kids did sorry. that study? I apologize the, to It's Fruit the same Loops. with Skittles, yeah. though, right? I don't know. Jolly I think Ranchers, it's all, the same. all of those things. It has one flavor. It's called sugar. Yeah, I want to see the parameters of that study and sort of the environment that study was done in on, this, on that college campus. Um, hey, that is going to do it for our cross-platform coverage of The Closing Bell here on Bloomberg TV radio, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Have a great rest of the day, guys. Our coverage continues right here on Bloomberg Television. A closer eye on the market and a closer eye on the VIX, which uh, breached a level that it might cause some investors concerns here. It's holding above that 200-day average for a 65th straight day in what historically has been a signal of pain for equities ahead. That conversation coming up after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bostic. Another record day on Wall Street, not necessarily for the S&P or NASDAQ, but the Dow did close at a record high. And I bring that up really to talk about this rotation that we continue to see here, an embrace of some of the cyclical names, an embrace of some of those small cap names. One of the biggest outperformances that we've seen on the Russell 2000 versus the NASDAQ in several weeks. That was partly aided by some of the moves that we saw in trucking, partly aided by some of the moves that we saw in industrials, partly aided by some big moves, Scarlett that we saw in the airline space. Yeah, you also include nuclear companies in there, and they're among the biggest gainers of the day. Let's take a look at some individual movers. And we're going to skip past uh, Morgan Stanley for a moment here and focus on New Scale and Oclo. Uh, nuclear stocks overall getting a big lift on the string of announcements that big tech companies are investing in small modular reactors. Amazon and Ken Griffin, the latest. Uh, this comes two days after Google made a similar investment in the industry. Morgan Stanley, the best performer in the KBW Bank Index, joining the rest of those big banks and reporting better than expected third quarter results led by its trading business. And of course, keeping an eye once again on ASML before TSMC reports its results overnight. ASML CEO says there's a slow recovery in demand, which has led to customers pushing out their spending and customers being fairly cautious at the moment. All right. We do want to talk a little bit here about some of the volatility that we have been seeing in this market. The key gauge of volatility in equities, the VIX. Well, that's been trading above the 200-day moving average for at least 65 sessions. That's the longest streak going back to 2020. Bloomberg's Jess Menton joins us right now and helps to lead our stock market coverage. And more importantly, she's here to tell us whether this portends something bad. I saw this story, this column that you wrote this morning. It was interesting. So I think we're day 65 now. That's correct. It's been above that 200-day moving average. More importantly, it was holding above 20, though I think it closed above 20 right. today, which is another kind of key psychological level. This isn't 40. This isn't right. 70, 80 like we saw back during the financial crisis. But it's still cause for concern. And especially because you brought up the 20 level being that psychological mm. threshold. So it's back below that. Today also was the VIX expiry too. And then we're going to have the options expiration on Friday. But for some context, that expiration is only going to be about half kind of the notional value that we would have seen back in September, which was much larger. But with that, when you're looking at the VIX and also just this year's average, it's still over 30 percent above that. And it had been that 200 day moving average is actually the lowest it's been since 2018. So that just tells you, obviously, we're in October. We're in the thick of earnings season. Next week's going to be the biggest by market cap for the S&P 500 with more than 30% of the index reporting. But then, of course, we all know we have the U.S. election on November yeah. 5th. And then the Fed decision will be two days later on November 7th. So when you're looking at actually what expired today, that would have been the futures for uh, the October VIX futures that actually yeah. expired. So that is all sort of in the spot VIX calculation right now. Uh, but looking ahead, if you're thinking about the VIX over the next month, obviously that's going to include those two big events when you are looking at what's happening with the election and when it comes to the Federal Reserve decision, but it's a little hard to show because if you're thinking about hedging, you're seeing that in SKU, you're seeing that in VOL, but you're not really seeing it really hedging across sectors in general. It seems like it's more event risk right now. Hmm. So the event risk is notable because, as you said, it goes out until about November 5th or 6th. Um, 
what typically happens to the VIX over this kind of period when you have a lot of events you know, lined up like that? I mean, are we expecting it to kind of drop off and, and dip below that 200-day moving average once we get past at least the calendar date of the election? So that's a great point because usually once the VIX is below that 200-day moving average, that bodes well for U.S. equity returns. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean you wouldn't see that with the VIX below or above 20, rather, because obviously if there's more volatility, you could see uh, bigger swings here. But in the past month, the S&P 500 has only swung about 1% in either directions in just three sessions. So usually in October, leading up to an election, you would see the VIX move higher. But usually when you strip out those really volatile years, uh, say like in 2008, obviously the global financial crisis, a lot of that can come down a yeah. little bit. I know I've asked you this before, but the folks you talk to uh, in the market, are they still using the VIX as kind of the primary gauge of equity market volatility? Because there's been a lot of talk how maybe it's broken. Maybe, I mean, I think we wrote a lot of stories here at Bloomberg <laughs> that said the VIX is broken. But, but in seriousness, it, it, are they still finding value in it? Well, I think so, but there's other yeah. ways in the derivatives market to see where hedging and risk is taking place. So if you looked at the CFTC futures, even in the last week, I mean, you can still see that traders are betting not on lower volatility. So traders actually cut their net ex short position in VIX futures to the small since January of 2019. And also, if you look at the cost of hedging, say, against the SPY, the ETF that tracks the S&P 500, that's been climbing higher, but still off of the highs that we would have seen, say, back in August, when obviously we had that tumult in the market and the global uh, markets, too. So you still are seeing the cost of hedging climbing a bit. Yeah. Uh, but the risk would also be when it comes to traders in the futures market, if they're too defensive right now, the risk would be well, what if they're too pessimistic and then they have to deploy more cash mm -hmm. after those risk events? And then you could see that fuel rally in the last two months of the year in the equity markets. All right. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, Jess Menton with the latest on VIX uh, and keeping an eye on that 20 level, especially as it holds above its 200 day moving average. All right. Let's move over to SL Green, uh, which just reported results. And right now we're looking at third quarter revenue of seventy eight point six million dollars, trailing the consensus estimate of eighty eight point two million dollars. Uh, Funds from operations uh, per share for the third quarter was $1.13. Analysts were looking for $1.24. So that is a miss on the top line and on the bottom line as well. Third quarter net operating income, $79 million, did increase 11% year over year. But uh, the funds from operations per share, uh, again, missing the consensus estimate. It'd be interesting to see what their outlook is. Of course, uh, SL Green, uh, primarily a Manhattan, a New York based uh, real estate company, though Discover Financial also reporting earnings right now. That's just crossing the wire here. And the company, I'm going to start here with the net interest income for the quarter. The company beating on that metric, $3.66 billion. Street was looking for $3.57. Total deposits higher than estimated. And net charge-offs lower than estimated. So that is a good thing. Loan volume also higher than estimated. Interest expense slightly higher than estimated. And here's your bottom line number for the third quarter, $3.69 a share on EPS. That's versus two fifty nine. dollars the previous quarter a year ago. Yeah, and we're looking at shares of Discover moving up slightly here in after hours trading. Uh Capital One, which is buying the company, not moving much at all right now in after hours trade. All right, coming up, stock market swings. We'll take a look at China's market performance and how government briefings have fueled these abrupt shifts in sentiment. There's more to come overnight out of China. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. We want to talk about the state of the electrical vehicle market and more importantly, one of the most important markets for those vehicles, and that is China, where we're actually starting to see a lot of companies, particularly European automakers, lose ground. BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen losing ground in their largest and most lucrative market, putting $38 billion of investment on the line. Keith Naughton is our man out in Detroit, and he joins us right now to talk a little bit more about this here. And there was a great story out of our colleagues in China on this, and it was kind of interesting, the sentiment that we heard from some of the folks quoted in that story, the actual consumers, as to why they maybe prefer non-German cars. Why, Keith? Yeah, you know, you have a lot of consumers in China who are very loyal German car buyers. The German big three controlled a quarter of the Chinese market before the pandemic. Now they're down to about 15 percent and importantly, less than 10 percent of the EV market. The Chinese EVs, first off, are cheaper by a lot. But secondly, they have better technology. I mean, way beyond just the touchscreens, Romaine. These are things like your kids get in the car and 
the vehicle welcomes them by name. It's really fascinating technology that the Chinese are putting in their EVs that Western automakers have not yet caught up with. So it sounds like it's more than just nationalism. It's actually the features that uh, people want and are looking for. So the BMWs and uh, the Volkswagens, what are they doing to fight back in China to kind of claim back some of that market share? Yeah, so, you know, they're uh, in many ways, if you can't beat them, join them, right? They are aligning with Chinese automakers to try and get some of the tech. You know, China leads in batteries for electric vehicles. They're leading in a lot of tech for electric vehicles. So they are aligning themselves with these Chinese automakers as a way to try and get a foot in the door to the EV market that the Chinese domestics and, importantly, Tesla really control. Those are the leaders in EVs in China. Is there a possibility that we could see any sort of catch up or is this getting so far away right now from the Western automakers that this could be perpetual, at least for, uh, for as far as we know? You know, Romain, I think Tesla proves that a Western automaker can succeed in EVs in China. But, you know, there's two big areas that the Western automakers have to get better at. One is lowering the cost. BYD, Lee Auto, all these domestic automakers are undercutting costs by a ton. It's not just a few bucks. And then the catch up on the tech. You know, Lee Auto has a car that parks itself. You get out of the car and it can drive several levels down in a parking garage and park itself. Yeah, that is uh, some, certainly some technology that uh, forces all the other automakers to play catch up. Keith, really appreciate your joining us and explaining what's going on in China with uh, EVs. We're going to shift gears now and just consider China overall, especially the broad mark, uh, the broad equity market, because the Shanghai Shenzhen 300 index uh, has seen an abrupt shift in sentiment. You can just see it here over the last uh, couple of weeks. And a lot of it has to do with stimulus and the drip, drip, drip of all the stimulus announcements. Here now to discuss more is Brendan Ahern. He is chief investment officer at Crane shares. And Brendan, uh, there's another drip coming out tonight, overnight, because we've got a couple of government agencies, the Housing Ministry, uh, the Ministry of Finance, and the PBOC, and one other agency all coming out with a joint announcement. And this goes back to that idea of more stimulus measures to come out. Yeah, 100 percent. We've seen a monetary a housing as well as a stock market bazookas being deployed. Uh, what we haven't really seen as much is on the fiscal side. We think yep. that's going to come. We'll have the NPC probably at the end of this month where that will be articulated. Uh, but on housing, you're seeing a lot of support. I think, you know, two thirds of urban household wealth is invested in housing. So if they can stabilize or even rise housing prices, I think the government believes that will raise consumer confidence and raise domestic consumption, which in light of a slowing global economy will pressure on export driven manufacturing, which has really been the staple of China's economy. But one of the big questions is, are they going to do it different this time? Because we've seen them yeah. support the housing market before and not necessarily in the most prudent manner. I, I, I kind of call it this is China's Tina stimulus moment. There is no other alternative. I mean, they have to rebuild confidence. They've told their own citizens, buy the stock market, buy housing. How do you back away from, you know, millions of people opening brokerage accounts and investing for the first time or coming into housing, first, second homes, based on all the measures they've done in terms of cutting interest rates and uh, down payment ratios, et cetera. So I don't think they have any choice but to keep the foot on the pedal. That may be, but is there a bright red line that China will not cross in terms of what they promise to, to do and what they promise to offer to investors? I think the main question that we'll find out that will be articulated over time is, is I don't think this is a broad fiscal bazooka of helicopter right. money or free checks in the mail. It's more of just applying applying kind of triage where necessary and kind of done incrementally over time that if there's more pressures on the economy, then you put the foot back down on the pedal. Yeah. And I think that's what's kind of led to some of the pullback we've seen yeah. is that lack of articulation. I am curious, though, for investors, and I'm talking about foreign investors and mm -hmm. primarily U.S. investors yeah. for that matter, that have really chased that China trade. Obviously, they've soured on it, but you're starting to see people dip their toe back into the water yeah. in a big way. I know yeah. we're nowhere near uh, the, the activity we for saw. Sure. 
Do you think we're going to get back there? I, I think first and foremost, in, in terms of the China unwind trade, mm -hmm. our thesis has been the rewind will start with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And that is without question happening in terms of southbound stock connect flow out of China into Hong Kong. The numbers are really, really strong. You're also seeing buybacks from the companies themselves, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in, in and it's self-serving and highly biased for us in the tech investment space. The founders are the chairperson or CEO of all of our companies that we're invested in. And if they thought China's economy or their corporate outlook was poor, they would hoard cash. But they're, they're spending it on. The other thing we're starting to see, Romain, is I think some of the money coming out of the historical overweights to both India and Japan, uh, valuation on the former, potentially the headwind of a stronger yen, and just some of that Asia money, I think will be a lot faster, some the strategic institutional investors, particularly here in the U.S., who might be hesitant for geopolitical reasons. Brendan, very quickly here, which would foreign investors prefer, a Trump presidency or a Harris presidency when it comes to Chinese companies? I, th I think it might sound paradoxical, but I, I think in China, people are rooting for, for Trump to be reelected, that they did a deal with Trump and that he is this some of this campaign rhetoric is probably an art of the deal. I think they'd actually prefer Trump rather than Biden, who never visited China mm -hmm. and has solely looked at China through a national defense prism. So there is no deal. Uh, so I think they would lean for the former. All right, Brendan, going to have to leave it there. Brendan Ahern is the chief investment officer for Crane Shares. A closer look here at uh, maybe a reemerging Chinese market. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the oil market. We're going to take a look back at this day in history and the day the Chevron moved to join the oil super majors by acquiring Texaco. That's coming up next right here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's take a quick look back at this day in history. Back in the year 2000, when Chevron, the second biggest U.S. oil company, agreed to buy the third largest, Texaco. The price tag, $45 billion in stock and assumed debt. And the intent, largely designed to give Chevron the size to better compete with bigger rivals like ExxonMobil, like Royal Dutch Shell, like BP Amigo, each the result of acquisitions themselves amid a persistent period of low oil prices that really did force a dramatic reshaping of the industry. Now, the stage for that was set back in 1997 and all the way into 1998 when Saudi Arabia engaged in this ill-fated competition with Venezuela for market share. Unfortunately, that saw OPEC as a whole lose control of the oil market, and that pushed down benchmark crude prices 60 percent over the year to less than $10 a barrel. That hobbled profits at oil and gas companies around the world and led the industry to beef up balance sheets so that they would have the money to pay for drilling new projects, mostly in those deep ocean waters off the Gulf of Mexico and off the coast of Brazil and West Africa. And the CEOs, they realized very quickly that buyouts, acquisitions would be the quickest way to do it. A wave of mergers followed, creating the era of what we now call the super majors. It was during this stretch from 1998 to the year 2000 when Exxon coupled with Mobil, BP bought Amoco, total combined with Elf and Chevron merged with Texaco. Shortly after that announcement, Phillips Petroleum bought refiner Tosco and Valero Energy struck a deal for Ultramar. The Texaco deal at the time it was announced was the third largest oil and gas merger involving a U.S.-based producer. And up until last year remained Chevron's biggest completed deal. That company now entering a new chapter, or at least trying to, abandoning California State, where it had been headquartered for more than 140 years, and moving to Texas, all while trying to put the finishing touches on a $53 billion acquisition for Hess, a deal that has cleared key regulatory hurdles, but is still being held up by legal arbitration involving its rivals, ExxonMobil and Cena, rivals that claim a right of first refusal on Hess's biggest asset, that 30% stake in that massive oil field off the coast of Guyana. That case, Scarlett, now before the International Chamber of Commerce, and it won't likely be settled into the third quarter of next year. Yeah, doing any kind of deal these days involves a lot of waiting and waiting through legal action as well. Let's turn back to the broader economy where we will get U.S. retail sales data tomorrow morning. Economists looking to a moderate gain in September as investors are still contending with higher costs. Seasonal factors are likely to be the key driver of this print, which is welcoming news to our next guest that relies on consumer resilience. Here in studio with us is Sten Parton. Sten is founder and CEO of Prism Places, which owns and operates mixed-use 
facilities for retailers, restaurants, and other outdoor activities. Stan, great to see you with us. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Your firm's expertise is clearly retail. And when I think about retail and shopping malls, there's been a lot of closures of yeah. malls over the last couple of years. So we know that supply is down. From where you sit, what does demand look like? I think demand looks stronger than it's ever looked. I think a lot of that is because how many malls have been taken offline? In the last 10 years, there's been 145 closures of malls across the U.S. As a result of that, with less supply, we at the same time that we had all that oversupply, we saw retail vacancy uh, that was between 8 to 10 percent of retail vacancy. Retail rent growth was between 1 and 2 percent for almost 10 years. These last two years where we've seen a lot of disclosures, I think that was forced as a result of the pandemic. We've seen rent growth above 5%. We've seen vacancy rates below 5%. So I think uh, the supply chain has really fixed itself. I think it's really right size in the retail product that we're seeing in the U.S. today. And it's a bright future ahead for the retail market. But is it similar to what we're seeing in the consumer space, which is high-end malls are doing a lot better than uh, medium-end or low-end malls? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's truly a story of winners and losers today. Yeah. I think there's great retail that we've all been to. We enjoy the experience. We know what it feels like. And yeah. there's retail that there really isn't. And I think the retail business, uh, unfortunately, was carbon copied across the U.S. We built malls everywhere we could. It was like Oprah giving a mall to every community who wanted one. Uh, and it's unfortunate because the experience really lacked in a lot of those places. But I think what we're seeing today is a flight to quality. We're seeing a flight to the best products, the best experiences. We're seeing brands today that have a great source of revenue through e-commerce, and they realize a really beautiful brick and mortar strategy at the same time. Those are our most successful brands, our most successful restaurants that we're seeing today as well. When it comes to the structure of malls, at least the malls that work, the malls that you're more interested in, in investing in, it, does the size matter? Because I think about some of those legacy malls, and I, yeah. you know, the ones we know as a kid that were these cavernous spaces that were great to hang out yeah. in, but at some point they became somewhat irrelevant. And I'm wondering, yeah. do those large-scale malls still have a future, or is it going to be something a little bit more mid-size, which seems to be like a lot of the places that you're involved in? Great question. I think you you see in a lot of the location where these you know dominant regional mall, malls once were. You know, they take 75 to 100 acres. There was a million square feet. Wow. I think you look at the way people shop those old malls, it was as a form of convenience. Today, you can shop so conveniently online. It doesn't mean all brick and mortar shopping is going away, but you don't need as much square footage as you once had. You see what's happening in the department store space with Sears closures, with Macy's closures, mm -hmm. what's happening with Bloomingdale's and even Marcus. So I think you see that the wholesale business in general, in general is going to be shifting to more of a direct business. We don't need as much square footage, yeah. but it opens up land for mixed use. You can add housing in as much needed communities. Right. You can build a much better experience for the retail in the retail environment. That's what we're starting to see. I've seen some pretty creative uh, ones, not, unfortunately not in this area, but certainly when you go uh, out west and, and down south, and even in the Midwest to that extent. Yeah. I am curious about demographics of yeah. the customers themselves. There is a narrative here that the young, younger generation doesn't want to go into a brick and mortar store. They just want yeah. to go on TikTok, Instagram, and then click over into whatever the e-commerce website is. Yeah. Is that a reality? I mean, I think you're seeing a real blend is I think yeah. um, the younger generation, their uh, wants and desires are very different. They have a very clear understanding of what they're looking for. They can get it instantaneously on their cell phone. Mm -hmm. But as a result of that, I think they're really looking for great experiences, physical experiences, mm -hmm. you know, in real life experiences. And so I think what you're seeing of today's best brands is they understand the digital component of running their business and having a direct relationship. Mm -hmm. But as the algorithm gets more and more complex, the mm -hmm. customer acquisition gets more and more expensive and harder to manage. When you look at a really smart brick and mortar strategy, it's a profitable store within their four walls. That connection between the e-commerce experience and the brick and mortar experience is what you're seeing today's, today's best brands doing. And I think the younger generations of millennials and Gen Z, that's what they want. They want a great online experience, but they also want to walk into a store. They want to feel the brand in real life. And they want to touch and feel a product or have a great cappuccino or a great latte. And that's what they're looking for today. It all goes back to Omnichannel, how it's a virtuous circle. I know that you are uh, very pro outdoor projects. It's been something that worked really well for you. And you're looking at the Sunbelt and Mountain West locations in particular. I'm curious about all the weather events that we've gotten, the extreme weather, yeah. and how that's caused you to rethink uh, making those structures, those facilities more resilient to the kinds of winds and flooding that we're getting now. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is... If somebody's not comfortable in your project, they're never going to spend time. You know, we're in the business of competing for people's time and money. Mm. So you have to give them a comfortable, enjoyable experience. And it starts with, you know, it's not too windy. They're protected from the elements. So that's where, you know, kind of number one, where it starts. 
But I think we love the Mountain West, we love the Sun Belt, and I think you know, we've started our business really in some of the highest barrier to entry markets like Southern California, where the climate is great, 365 days a year. It's given us an ability to really hone our craft, sharpen the sword of what the experience needs to be for today's best customers, and we can export that experience to maybe you know, secondary markets that haven't seen some of these great outdoor mixed use experiences, outdoor environments, and maybe haven't seen brands that they're looking for unless they were in, you know, in New York or Seattle, some of the different coasts of where they would have an opportunity to shop those brands. All right, Stan, great stuff. Uh, great to have you here. Stan Parton, founder and CEO over at Prism uh, Places. We are uh, getting some uh, earnings, uh, additional earnings crossing uh, the wire right now. This on uh, Steel Dynamics. Let's get right to it, uh, guys. Uh, interesting to see the initial market reaction is to the upside, despite a little bit of weakness in certain areas. Now, the net sales did slightly beat a $4.3 billion. The street was looking for about $1.7, and you did get a bottom line number of 205 above the 198 estimate here. Uh, some of the individual units uh, metrics did come in slightly lower than expectations, but overall, People seem to like what they see, Scarlett. Yeah, and that stock moving up uh, 3% in after hours trading. Um, as for how the markets closed overall, just a quick run through here. Uh, we have the S&P 500 uh, levitating higher by one half of 1%. Uh, not a record high after uh, the recent pullback, but still uh, gains all around for the major equity indexes. And the Russell 2000 closing at a three-year high, still shy of its all-time high set in late 2021. But uh, certainly that was your best performer. Yields on the 10-year moving down to 4.01%. And Bitcoin I just threw in there because we're getting close to that $70,000 level. Yeah, absolutely. Here, when you look at some of the big movers in after hours trade, the biggest gainer is Alcoa. Those shares uh, up uh, right now about 5%. Those earnings just crossing the wire, a beat on the top and bottom line. Meanwhile, some of the biggest decliners, you're going to find that in real estate with SL Green. You're going to find that in the credit card space with Discover Financial. And you're going to find that in oil services with Kinder Morgan. A lot more coverage coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. It is time now for the top three, where we name drop some of the people driving the day's most talked about stories. And first up is the CEO of Chobani, Hamdu Ulukaya. His net worth rose to two and a half billion dollars as earnings from the yogurt maker nearly doubled last year. And we only know about this because of uh, bond filings. Uh, their sales in 2023, two and a half billion dollars, up 12 percent from a year earlier. I would love to be a sky on of yoga. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, congratulations to him. We've interviewed him a couple times. Seems like a pretty decent guy here. And obviously, uh, he's built a wonderful business. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on uh, someone else, not necessarily as wonderful, but a person we pay a lot of attention to. The boxer Floyd Mayweather struck a deal to buy $402 million of an affordable housing portfolio here uh, in upper Manhattan of New York City. Uh, the seller was Black Spruce Management. No one really wants to comment on this, though Floyd Mayweather did take uh, to uh, the X platform to confirm that that deal had been done. Of course, uh, he has made probably well over a billion dollars in his career uh, trying to put some of that money uh, to some good investment use. Yeah, Floyd Mayweather unlocking some of the um, paralysis in the commercial real estate market. Yeah, who it. knew? <laughs> <laughs> All right, third on the docket is Travis Kelsey, the football player and also boyfriend of uh, one Taylor Swift, is serving as Ooh. host of a new game show. You know who she is. No. Uh, Are You Smarter Than a Celebrity, which premieres tonight? Not clear what kinds of questions they're going to be asking. If it has to do with money, then, yeah, I think uh, you're probably not going to be. But the big question is, is Taylor going to be on the show? Uh, yeah, I mean, I assume at some point, you know, they'll have a cameo. Or, or, like, maybe she'll just zoom in or something. But they got to, right? Yes. I mean, he goes to all her stuff, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. No, and, it, yeah. I mean, she would be a reigning bonanza, right? Especially as she gets ready to start the next leg of her Eras Tour, which continues. It's, like, two years on, and it hasn't stopped. Oh, is that what we're doing? <laughs> no, I'm just uh, bringing her up because it's a... It's a Anytime you mention Travis Kelsey, it's a way to get into her. All right. Uh, let's uh, get back to something serious here. We've been actually speaking all week long with some of the most prominent figures shaping cities across the world. More than 500 mayors and policymakers are gathered in Mexico City for the 11th edition of the Bloomberg City Lab. 
Carlos Rodriguez is Bloomberg executive producer for Latin American Partnership, and he joins us on the ground uh, from that event here. And we've had a chance. Carlos, actually, great to see you again. Love the beard. Uh, we actually uh, we have talked to a couple of the, uh, the mayors and other people who have been down there here. But as you sort of enter this next day here, I am curious about kind of what was kind of the overarching theme that you were hearing on the ground from folks uh, over the last couple of days. Well, yes, things are wrapping up here, and many of these mayors that are right now here in a couple hours will be heading to the airport, and they have a big challenge after that, and it's how to materialize some of these ideas about promoting affordable housing, making more efficient transportation, how to limit the irregular settlements, how to bring some of the ideas that they heard here to the lo uh, with the local realities where there are stakeholders where they may face some resistance, as you know, Cities struggle sometimes in that in that phase. There's always resistance. There's the mentality of not in my backyard. So we have hearing here from the mayors how uh, some of the tools that they plan to use to to address some of these challenges and hopefully mainly create more affordable housing in many of the cities where they are trying some of the efforts that they discussed during the event. I'm curious how many of the solutions that are bandied about to uh, providing more affordable housing has to do with perhaps the federal government getting involved, given that uh, you have both campaigns discussing this as uh, something that they would tackle. Yes, uh, I mean, everybody has a different recipe for this, but the one, the, and, and we heard the, uh, several cases that sounded very interesting. One that caught my attention in particular was about a city that just in the matter of four months was able to convert a public parking lot into about 40 housing units uh, for people of low income. Where is the city? It's not in a developing country, it's not in a low income country, that city is Atlanta. So it's the example of the city of Atlanta that can help other cities, not only in South America or Asia, but also in the U.S., in how to get things moving fast. Because as you know, mayors, politicians discuss a lot about uh, projects to create more houses, uh, houses that are affordable for the average family, but at the end of the day, some of these projects are taking three, four years, and that's not uh, acceptable for many of these families. So these type of projects, using in this case of Atlanta, for example, shipping containers, are offering new solutions to these historic problems. Uh, that's actually pretty fascinating, Carlos. So uh, we're going to have to leave it there. But uh, some great stories uh, coming out of that event, that Bloomberg City Lab event uh, down in Mexico City. Carlos Rodriguez, who helps uh, uh, lead our coverage of these events. Uh, but stick with us here. We got a lot more coming up here on the close. We're going to set you up for what to watch over the next 24 hours. And that includes a big earnings report out of Netflix. This is Bloomberg. We are counting you down to the big event. Netflix results due tomorrow afternoon after the close. Analysts are expecting gains in subscribers, revenue, and profits. Joining us now to discuss is Mark Zagorski. He is CEO of Double Verify, which is one of the industry's leading measurement platforms for streaming. So, um, Mark, when we look at the numbers for Netflix, it's going to be an up arrow for things like subscribers, revenue, and profits. But the subscriber number is going to be something that Netflix tells us um, for less time uh, going forward because they want to steer people away from that focus. Um, what, are, what, can we, what do we know right now about the growth of subscribers slowing and what that tells us about its outlook? Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting point and it shows that they're gonna be committed to other forms of revenue moving ahead beyond just subscriber growth, right? The, and the big part of that is advertiser revenue. Um, we know it's gonna be a bigger part of their plans moving forward. We've seen them move from inception uh, to a handful of millions of uh, ad supported subscribers to now over 40 million. Um, so I think that's gonna be a, a big uh, focus of, of where their revenue is gonna come from. And I think when you start looking at metrics around the business, it's gonna be less about subs and more about you know, advertising revenue, CPMs, um, where they're expanding advertising footprint around the globe, um, because I think it's going to be a big driver and it's a very high margin um, area of growth for them. Right. And Netflix certainly has the data that advertisers are looking for to really target their consumer. Um, you, we know that analysts are also expecting Netflix to announce potential price increases in the U.S. 
is part of the strategy, you think, to increase prices for the advertising free tier to drive more people to the ad supported tiers? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think, you know, look, they want to make as much margin as they can from each subscriber. And those lower price tiers just don't drive better margins. So I think you're going to create a really dumbbell effect here. You're going to have the ad supported subscribers that they're going to drive as many people to that tier as they can. And then you're going to have the super premium subscribers on the other end. Um, we've known that middle of the road strategies generally don't produce as much as ones where you extremely, you know, take the, uh, the highest margin per, per user. So I think they want to build that ad supported tier to get scale. Um, they were knocked a little bit back, I think, earlier this year when um, Amazon introduced advertising really to a, big, a pretty big surprise to the industry and instantly added 100 million ad-supported subscribers into the universe of the CTV ad world. And yeah. I think, you know, they want to get that big. I am curious, though, Mark, when we talk about this, this ad rollout, and at least by all initial measures, it seems to have been a success. Part of the maintaining that success is making sure that you know, the ads are sticky to a certain extent that I actually going to watch them, that I don't actually get up and just walk away from the TV or find some other sort of work around so that I don't have to watch them here. Do you think that they have a viable way to ensure that or at least to give in, uh, advertisers the confidence that people are actually seeing them? Yeah, I, you know, I think it starts with building great content around which people don't want to leave, even just to get up for a second. So I think their investment in live sports around NFL and mm. uh, WWE are going to be key parts of that content slash advertising strategy. Um, and then innovative technologies. So you mentioned targeting and data earlier. The better data that Netflix has, the more relevant those ads will be and the more people are willing to watch them. So I think data plays a big role in this. And then other new technologies like pause ads. So even when you get up and if you pause something mm -hmm. to leave the screen, they're going to run something in that place um, that'll be on that screen when you sit back down on the couch. So uh, tech and data are going to be a big part of the engagement process. Uh, and I'm curious, and, and on that note, when do we start seeing the ads more engaging? I've seen just, and, and not necessarily on Netflix, but on some of the other streaming platforms from time to time, they'll have an ad running. And then it says, if you, you know, click this button, it'll presumably take you to wherever you need to go to buy it or, or a QR code that you can hold your phone up to. Are we going to see more experimentation with that? I, I definitely believe so. You know, as technology gets more precise, as AI contextual tools, like some of the ones that DV is building, um, become more accurate in identifying scene changes and what's going on in scene, scene changes in video and understanding that, hey, there's a product opportunity here um, where the next ad should relate to what happened in that scene. Yeah. Uh, you're going to see much more relevance and, and better ads. All right, uh, got to leave it there, Mark. Uh, great stuff here. Mark Zagorski is the CEO over at Double Verify, one of the industry's leading measurement platforms for streaming, taking a closer look at Netflix. Uh, those results coming after the bell tomorrow. A few other things to keep your eye on over the next 24 hours that could move markets, including some earnings overnight out of Taiwan. Yeah, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing will be closely watched. Of course, we got a huge announcement from ASML um, a day early, as it turns out, that, uh, you know, really gave investors cause for concern when it comes to the chip industry. Uh, the takeaway from ASML is the chip recovery yeah. will be slow. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see what they say. So we go from Taiwan over to Europe, where we're actually going to get a rate decision out of the ECB. Yeah, it's expected to cut interest rates for a second straight meeting following the Fed's decision to cut rates last month. Um, and uh, we're looking for a three and a quarter percent key deposit rate. OK, is the market going to rally on that? <laughs> I think the market's <laughs> priced everything in. All right, let's go from Europe back here to the U.S., where we are going to get a, a hodgepodge of economic data. Yeah, and I think the one that everyone's watching, of course, is retail sales, uh, the strength of the consumer, the resilience of the consumer. But also also initial jobless claims because we're so concerned with the state of the labor market. All right. Of course, uh, team surveillance, uh, the folks in the morning as well as open interest will have the coverage of all of those data points that come out. And then right here on the close tomorrow after the bell, we will have full wall to wall coverage of those results out of Netflix. Expectation is for about four and a half million new subscribers. Yeah. And of course, the big question is how much progress are they making on moving people over to the ad supported tier? They, I feel like they seem to be forcing it. I mean, we, we do the non ad tier, but they keep sending us like advertising yeah. saying we should switch over, which I'm like, why? Well, they're going to raise that? prices on you. So you do do it. Join us tomorrow here on the close for all your politics coverage. Sit tight. Balance of power up next right here on Bloomberg.